perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. The wonderful book of Revelation is really written to reveal Jesus Christ. It says so in the very first two verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Jesus is the main character and the central theme of the book of Revelation. The entire book focuses on his second coming, his return to earth in glory, to judge the wicked and to reward the righteous. This book tells about the events leading up to his return and the events following his return. The first three chapters of Revelation deal with letters sent to seven churches in Asia Minor, and the messages to the seven churches can be viewed as timeless. In other words, the problems that the church at Ephesus face, we face. The problems that the church of Smyrna faced, we face, and so on. In almost every church today, you will find Ephesian Christians, Sardis Christians, and Laodicean Christians. The problems, temptations, promises, and blessings are all still issues that we wrestle with today. Even today, the Spirit is still making the plea for those who have an ear to hear what He is saying to the churches. In these letters, Jesus outlines His plan for the church for us. He shows us why He has set His church in the midst of the world. The church is His instrument to influence and direct the course of human history. Chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation give us a picture of heaven as things are being prepared for the breaking of judgment upon the earth. From chapter 6 onwards, we begin to see the unfolding of judgment as Jesus prepares to come and take the earth and the universe that is rightfully His. In Revelation, there are three series of seven events that occupy the last seven years of human history. The first series is the opening of the seven seals. The second series is the seven trumpets that will sound. And finally, the seven bowls of wrath that will be poured out upon the earth. Each of these series of sevens end with the same sights and sounds, namely flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and the great earthquake. These sights and sounds mark the close of the age of mankind upon the earth, but they also mark the beginning of God's kingdom on the earth. When we examined Revelation 4 verses 5, John recorded these same cataclysmic sounds. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. In Revelation 8 verses 5, the same event occurs, and later again in Revelation 11, when the seventh angel will sound the seventh trumpet, these same sounds are heard again. Do not try to understand these events of Revelation as a series of chronological events, but as degrees of intensity. The judgments of the seven seals of Revelation take place in the seven-year period that the prophet Daniel identifies as the last days. The sounding of the seven trumpets, however, are a return to that same seven-year period and focus on a deeper and different perspective of judgment. At the beginning of chapter 11, there is a definite change of perspective in the book of Revelation. It seems as if John is sent back over the terrible times of judgment to focus on certain characters and personalities and to give us more detail about them. John is told to prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. That is going to be the theme of the next chapters of Revelation. In Revelation 11, we begin to focus on certain personalities and characters which appear in the flesh in the last days. This chapter 11 is part of the break between the sounding of the sixth and the seventh trumpet, where John is given a new assignment. At the close of chapter 10, John is given a little scroll of prophecy to eat. He ate the scroll, and that act of eating symbolized him becoming personally involved with God's plan for the last days. From this point on, John is no longer a mere observer. Now he has become part of the action in Revelation 11 verses 1 to 3. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. The act of measuring a specific area 
has a lot of symbolic meaning. In Ezekiel chapter 40, in Zechariah chapter 2, and even later on in Revelation, the prophets are told to measure something. Measuring is always a sign of God's ownership. This is the way we use measuring today. If someone has a dispute with a neighbor about the border of a property, a surveyor is hired to measure the property and mark out the boundaries. Here God gives the prophet a measuring rod and tells him to measure the temple and the altar and even the worshippers who come there. But notice, he is told to exclude the outer court of the temple. This is obviously an earthly temple. Earlier in Revelation, we saw a temple opened in heaven. There is a temple in heaven, and that is the same temple that Moses saw when he was on Mount Sinai and was told to make an exact copy of that temple when building the tabernacle. However, even the heavenly temple is symbolic, for it pictures the true dwelling place of God. At the end of Revelation, we are going to discover that the dwelling place of God is, in fact, man. Believers are the temple of God. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19. He declares that we will become the ultimate dwelling place of God in his universe. In Revelation 11, however, it is clear from the mention of the holy city that this temple that John is told to measure is the one in Jerusalem. Today, in 2021, there is no temple in Jerusalem. The last temple was destroyed by Titus, the son of the emperor Vespasian, in 70 AD, when Roman armies surrounded the city and broke through the defenses of the Jews and completely demolished the temple. At the moment, there are two buildings on the Temple Mount. One is the Islamic Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the other one, which is the most well-known building, is called the Dome of the Rock. This is the building with the golden dome and the bright blue sides that is the focus of almost all photographs of Jerusalem. These two buildings are an obstacle to the rebuilding of the temple. Since 1967, when the Jews recaptured the old city of Jerusalem, the Muslims have been allowed complete control of worship on the Temple Mount. Neither Jews nor Christians are permitted to worship there now, only the Muslims. Most Jews consider it necessary to destroy the Dome of the Rock in order to rebuild the Jewish temple on that site. But in the last two decades, a lot of archaeological research has been done to locate exactly where the ancient temple was built. It has been discovered that the temple was not built on the spot where the Dome of the Rock stands, but actually it was built just north of the dome, in what is still an open, uncovered area, occupied only by a small shrine called the Dome of the Spirits. If this is correct, it might be then possible for the Jewish temple to be rebuilt on Mount Moriah without destroying the Dome of the Rock. Why is this so important? If the temple is built north of where the Dome of the Rock is currently located, the outer court of the temple will include the Dome of the Rock. John is told to exclude the outer court because it has been given to the Gentiles, or the nations, for 42 months and this refers to that area where the Dome of the Rock now stands. 42 months is exactly three and a half years, one half of seven years. Which three and a half year period does this refer to? It probably refers to the first half of the seven year week, and that allows for the construction of a restored Jewish temple on the top of Mount Moriah. These two verses of Revelation 11 show us that God himself is focusing upon the temple. John measures the temple and its altar. It is a sign of God's ownership in those last days. I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. These two important characters move in from the wings almost totally unannounced. Paul says in Acts 14 verses 17 that God never leaves himself without a witness. Here in Revelation 11, In the midst of the greatest time of apostasy that the world has ever seen, God still keeps a witness. This comes in the form of two individuals, dressed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is the traditional garb of a prophet when he was sent to declare some threatened judgment from God. 
These two individuals appear because their ministry is to counter the delusions, lies and humanistic propaganda masquerading as the truth which comes from the man of lawlessness in that day. Jesus also spoke of this temple and this man of lawlessness. He said in Matthew 24 verses 15 that, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The holy place is the temple, and the abomination of desolation which Daniel had predicted is a depiction of the ministry and the person of the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. Paul tells us about this man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 to 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So, both the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul agree that the temple will be built on Mount Moriah, and it will be occupied by the one whom John calls the Antichrist in 1 John 2 verses 18. The Antichrist will feature again in chapter 13 as the beast that rises from the earth, claiming the worship of the earth for himself because, as representative man, he believes he is really God, man as his own God. We hear a great deal of that today, but then it will be universally welcomed. These two witnesses will be allowed to witness for 1,260 days, which is 42 months or three and a half years. If the 42 months that the nations trample down the holy city is the first half of that period, then the change to 1,260 days here probably indicates that the witness of these two men takes place during the last half of the week, or during the Great Tribulation. The Lord Jesus told us in Matthew 24 verses 21 about that coming time of trouble, such as has not been seen from the beginning of the world until now. But who are these two witnesses? We have some clues as to their identity. First, we are told that there are two olive trees and two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. It is easy to recognize the meaning of those symbols because the prophet Zechariah uses them as well. In Zechariah 4, we read of two olive trees that drip their oil into two lampstands as a witness to Israel. Here in Revelation 11 are two men who symbolically are like lampstands, giving light in the midst of the darkness of earth. They are fed by the Spirit of God Himself, because olive oil symbolizes the Spirit, so their witness cannot be extinguished. They cannot be eliminated until their work is done. They are especially protected by God because fire comes out of their mouth to destroy anyone who tries to harm them. The power that these two witnesses wield is strongly suggestive of the ministry of Elijah the prophet. In the book of 2 Samuel, we are told on two different occasions concerning the ministry of Elijah when the king sent a company of 50 soldiers to take the prophet captive. Each time fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. Perhaps one of these witnesses is Elijah, returning to the earth. The book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, predicts that very thing in Malachi 4 verses 5. You can read that by yourself. Furthermore, in the Gospel of Matthew in the 17th chapter, after the account of the transfiguration of Jesus, when Peter, James and John came down the mountain after seeing Moses and Elijah there with the Lord Jesus, the disciples asked them, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And Jesus answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. Jesus explained that in a sense Elijah had already come, because John the Baptist had operated in his ministry in the spirit and power of Elijah. That does not mean, of course, that Elijah will not come. He will come, just as the Lord Jesus told us. So we can be fairly certain that Elijah could be one of these two witnesses. Who is the other witness? There are some more clues. These men were given power, first to stop all the rain upon the earth. That reminds us of Elijah, who had authority from God to withhold rainfall. For three and a half years, it did not rain in Israel until he prayed and asked God to restore rain again. But these two witnesses also had power to turn the waters into blood and to bring plagues and diseases among the people. That certainly refers to the ministry of Moses. 
When Pharaoh hardened his heart against Moses' appeal to let the people of God go, Moses turned the waters of the Nile into blood and called plagues down upon the Egyptians. So this is why many Bible expositors see these two witnesses as Moses and Elijah appearing again. Some say it will be Enoch and Elijah because these are the two men of the Old Testament who never died. They were caught up into heaven without death. In some of the earliest Christian writings, there is reference to Enoch and Elijah as the two witnesses. There are some recent teachings that go as far as to saying that these two witnesses are not two individuals, but two groups, Israel and the church, symbolized by the olive trees and the lampstands mentioned in Revelation 11 verses 4. The olive tree is often used to symbolize the nation of Israel. The olive tree is often used to symbolize the nation of Israel, and the lampstands refer back to the church in Revelation 1. We cannot be absolutely certain that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah, or Elijah and Enoch, but it might be wise to remember that it was Moses and Elijah who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Peter, who was a witness of that event, tells us that it was a picture of the coming again of Jesus. He says so in 2 Peter 1 verses 16 to 18. So now that we are actually dealing with the second coming of the Lord Jesus in Revelation, it seems most likely that it is Moses and Elijah who are these two witnesses. Now we move on to Revelation 11 verses 7 to 10. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. The first thing you might notice is the words, when they have finished their testimony. No one can interfere until their work is done. But then, the beast from the bottomless pit attacks them. That phrase, beast from the bottomless pit, takes us back to Revelation 9 verses 11. There we saw the star that fell from heaven who was given a key to open the abyss and out of it came terrible symbolic locusts. Their king, we are told, was from the abyss or the bottomless pit. His name was Abaddon, which means destruction, and Apollyon, which means destroyer. It should be evident, as we saw then, that this was Satan himself. The man of lawlessness, as Paul tells us, will be possessed by Satan. Just as Satan entered into Judas before his betrayal of the Lord, so Satan possesses the Antichrist, this man of lawlessness, that we will learn much more about in this book. It is he who attacks these two witnesses and puts them to death. They have been a constant thorn in his side. These two witnesses kept telling the truth to the people, telling them what the actual plan of God would be. They kept warning the world's nations, that they were being deceived by the lies and deception of that day. At last the Antichrist will be allowed to kill them, and this is the cause of great celebration on the earth. Today, when non-believers accomplish something that delights them, they say, let's party. A great celebration breaks out in Jerusalem at that time. They refuse to bury these two men, but gloat over their death and display their bodies for all the world to see. Although it isn't implied here, you can guess that the technology of television and internet streaming will be used because every nation, tribe and language and people will gaze upon the dead bodies of these two witnesses. The city here is called symbolically Sodom and Egypt. Sodom because of its perverse behavior and Egypt because of its persecution and slavery. But at the same time, it is clearly identified as the city where their Lord was crucified. It is ironic that the hatred of the world against the cause of Christ reveals itself in a great party where people actually give gifts to each other, just like Christmas, celebrating the deaths of these two witnesses that have been such a painful reminder of their sinful practices. But even despite the Antichrist and the unrepentant nations of the world, God still has the last word in Revelation 11 verses 11 to 14. 
after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Just like Jesus before them, these two witnesses are privileged to pass through the same experience that he went through, and in the same place, the city of Jerusalem. They are cruelly killed, as he was killed, and they are resurrected three and a half days later and ascend into heaven before the eyes of the startled crowd. Twice we are told of the fear and terror of the people of earth. They sense the chill of their own defeat in what they see. The spectators of this event must be asking, who can oppose a God of resurrection power? The worst anyone can do, Jesus said in Matthew 10.28, is to put us to death, but after that he declared, there is nothing more they can do. Not even death can stop God carrying out his program. It is a wonderful truth that we learn here. This is the destiny of everyone who believes in Jesus. We shall all die, except those who are caught up at the end, and even they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. If we die, we shall be resurrected and shall ascend into heaven to be with the Lord Jesus forever. This is also the destiny of the two faithful witnesses. We should not be surprised that God takes care of his own this way, for he does this for all who put their trust in Christ. It is also not surprising that these who dwell on the earth should feel terror when this happens. Who can defeat the God of resurrection? The hope of every believer throughout the ages has been that death cannot claim us finally. We can agree with the Apostle Paul when he says in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 55, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 39.